Leadership Conference. And I was there not because I felt like I needed to be there. I was there for work. I was there on a recruitment trip. I worked at a seminary at the time. And just as a bystander, listening to the conversations and the stories of the presenters and even in just informal conversations, resonating so much with their testimony and realizing that I was so busy trying to be in this world that I didn't even know I was missing a piece of myself. Um, and so certainly in that context, when I'm around other Asian American women that are also living very hybrid identities, straddling, um, particularly ministers, straddling um, gender roles, um, uh, particularly um, feeling like I can really be myself and I don't have to explain a lot about my context for them to get it or for me to even get them. So that's certainly a piece of it. But now living in Wisconsin, I hardly have that kind of environment. Um, so I'm probably, I've been here three years now and, and probably am pretty deficient in that kind of um, connection. And even now probably not realizing how deficient I am in it. Um, Cause I've compensated, I've, I've coach shifted enough. Um, so that's one setting that I feel I can be myself. Um, certainly when I'm around Filipinos and can kind of get on my Filipino accent, that's a lot of fun. <laughs> Uh, but also just being around other hybrids, people that have always grown up in very diverse settings and very naturally maneuver around different cultures. Um, that's certainly a place of comfort um, and a source of encouragement. Um, so those are important spaces for me. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you for that. One of the things that I've come to learn though is hybridity doesn't just come um, when you're a hyphenated American, right? So Asian American or, or African American or Hispanic American, but hybridity comes in many different ways. Um, so do you, Tamri, resonate with this term hybridity and sort of that negotiating identity? How do you experience that? And how does that connect with your work um, for racial justice? I think it, I think the ways that my identity um, has some fractures in it, gives me some insight into what that experience of hybridity is like, although I don't think that it's pro as profound as someone who um, might have a multicultural or multiracial um, family setting. I think it's, it's not quite that profound. Probably the, the way that I identify with that the most is um, when I teach students about their social location and help them to begin to parse their identity. I have a way of mapping that out across race, gender, sexual orientation, class, religion, lots of different characteristics, and go through an analysis of which ones of these identities help me to access social power and resources and which ones don't. And I literally draw that with arrows, you know, on a whiteboard across these categories. And they can see the they they can guess the down arrow for my female identity pretty quickly. Um, they don't always guess that I'm gay, and um, so the fact that I have aspects of my identity that empower me and that give me social privilege, like being white and um, being middle class, having a religion that roughly mass matches the rest of the um, people around me for the most part those kinds of things are complicated by being female and being gay. Um, and sometimes people are still are kind of surprised at the way gay and Christian go together in my life that, um, and a commitment to trying to live into an anti-racist identity complicates things too, where um, my way of being white looks a little bit different. And I hope it does. I hope that it demonstrates my commitment uh, to what I'm trying to do with my life in the way that I consider that part of my, my Christian identity. So um, those are, those are things that are kind of speed bumps, I think, in people's experience of me and for me and my experience of the world. And I, I think of them as, as building blocks for my identity and try to think carefully about how some aspects of those identity, like being female, being queer, um, give me some critical perspective on the parts of my life where I do have um, 
more of a perhaps mainstream identity or an identity that gives me an easier access to social goods and resources mm -hmm. to privilege. Okay. Yeah, I think we might talk a little bit more later on um, the access to social power um, in one of our other questions. But staying first on um, the concept of, or the topic of identity, um, in your chapter, um, you one of the first things you talk about for the need for white folks to come to a critical awareness, and you suggest um, a practice of saying your name, my name is, fill in the blank, and I am a racist. Um, can you unpack that a little bit? You even use the term being an anti-racist white person in what you just shared. Um, unpack that a little bit. What does it mean in your experience, in your mind, to say, I am a racist, and then alternately to declare that you want to be an anti-racist white person? Yeah, even though I I've, I've feel that I've been living into this commitment of trying to, to, to live into this anti-racist identity for a long time now, I think I get less and less willing to to just flat out claim the label because it does feel like it's something that I'm always approaching and moving toward as opposed to, oh, well, you know, I, I got this down. No, the way our culture is always wanting to um, give me the privilege that comes with white skin, it just, it, it, it's an everyday thing. And so just like coming out is, you know, you're always coming out somewhere if you're gay mm. and you're out as an anti, as a person trying to live into an anti-racist identity, it is a daily thing and multiple times a day. And so coming to that critical awareness of, um, of how, how this is such a daily practice, I think is really important. Um, about the term and, the, and then the practice of saying, you know, my name is Tamri and I'm a racist. You know, that's just a reality. It is, it is in me from my growing up days in South Texas where uh, my dad was, was, a, was pretty overtly um, bigoted against the Mexican and Mexican American people around us, even the people that worked for him. There just was an intrinsic understanding that um, some people groups were less than and some were more than. And so I grew up in that. It's like it was in the water and in my bones. And you can't just extract that coding, you know, it's in there. So my role is to resist it every day. And saying something like, my name is Tamri and I'm a racist is a way of grappling with that deep coding um, and to recognize that, yep, that's in there. And that's not all I am. I also am a person who's struggling with that. I also am a person who is committed to practices of dismantling racism. Um, I also am a person whose who's actual identity is that I'm a child of God made in the image of God and therefore good. And um, racism is something that I regard as sin that has warped my identity as a white person, that has limited my identity as a white person, that hurts me even as it hands me privilege. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for me to say those words, I am, I am a racist person, is to accompany those words with, and I am committed to rooting it out in myself, um, in the settings that I find myself. So it's just to be aware of reality as it is, but also to take responsibility for changing reality, for not accepting it as it is. And to me, language has power. You know, when I midlife finally heard the words anti-racist and dismantling racism, I was thrilled because finally I had an, I had an alternative. And that was so powerful for me. And I talk about that a little bit in the chapter, how, you know, searching out the alternatives to what is, is not okay as it is, is really powerful. It gives you a place to go with the pain that you feel as you see things like um, Charlottesville and mm -hmm. the, the diatribes over taking a knee, you know, those kind of conversations, you can have a critical stance in those conversations if you're grappling with your own identity. So if I can just um, add a little bit. So I, I work with a lot of well-meaning people. Um, and what would you say to white folks who are Northerners <laughs> and might have parents who taught them to love everybody and uh, to treat everybody equally? 
and um, have with their best effort tried to live that way in life, is there value for, for them to explore that statement that I am a racist? And, and so what would you say to folks that um, have that stance? I think some of the language that's really helpful for me around that is uh, what Howard Zinn says, uh, you can't be neutral on a moving train. Hmm. You know, we are all on a moving train and it is moving in the direction of continuing to assign access to power and resources to white people. And in a society that's predicated that way, then the only uh, response is resistance and active engagement to stop the train and send it in a different direction. And so to say, I'm not a racist, I think is to want to put your head in the sand about how this country was uh, created in its founding documents and by its founders to benefit a certain class of people, white males. And to understand that our society still hands overt privilege predominantly to white males. If you're not grappling with that, then you're not grappling with reality. And I think that I just think that's that's so important. I don't think we do any good work without that awareness and without that commitment. Great. Thank you. So I had, um, there was another point that I was interested in your chapter where you talk about the different approaches um, or entry points to the work of grappling with racism. And I wondered if uh, you might say a little bit about those approaches, maybe name them or say a bit about mm -hmm. them, but, but tell us about the approach that feels the most resonant for you. Like mm -hmm. which one is the one that perhaps you tend to go to. And if there's one that you kind of aspire to engage more often. Sure. So I, I, um, I used four terms uh, and that was um, introduced to me through something similar like this. It was an online engagement with um, faith leader and, and writer Bruce Reyes Chow. We were um, having racial conversations. Um, this was after he wrote his book, but I don't see you as Asian. And it was in an email conversation afterwards between the panelists. And he talked about these different approaches that people take and the four that he named which resonated with me just around the circles that I had um, been in interaction with. He mentioned um, the approach through academics. So for people that are writing about it, studying it, researching it, and um, uh, shedding some light based in that way. Um, people that approach race, uh, racial justice work through relationships, really working at Crossing, uh, crossing differences, building bridges, one-on-one uh, -on -one or among people group. Another one would be through the arts. So there's various artists, whether the medium is through painting, uh, movies, writing, um, people who comment on uh, the reality of race relations, racism through the arts. And the fourth would be the activists, people that are uh, through various ways um, and tactics trying to change social structures and really addressing structural racism, um, institutional racism. So that really helped frame um, kind of the various people that I was engaged in at the time. I probably resonate um, most naturally relationships. Um, you know, that was part of my self description that relationships is everything that comes from my upbringing where I come from a very communal uh, culture where um, relationships between everyone within the community are um, defined, they're evolving, but they're also defined and they have very uh, important significance. So I think I began my work in this, particularly on relationships, did a lot on cross-cultural training, cross-cultural relationships and communication. Um, as I spent some time in academia, um, I would say I approach it through academics as well. I just finished some doctoral work on um, multicultural le uh, leadership and the responsibilities for that. Um, and I also named myself as a born again poet. Um, and so I think through my writing, I'm exploring more about how to 
work out some of my own questions, how to speak to the things that I see um, and to speak prophetically through my writing. Uh, oddly enough, I went back to some of my old college writing and there was a lot of sort of um, social commentary in my, in my poetry in college too, which I really didn't know I was doing at the time. Um, so I think my growing edge is the activism piece. I um, admire a lot of the people that are in my circles and the work that they're doing, the bold stands they're taking. Um, I learn a lot from them and just being around them and exploring what that might look like in my life. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, I'll just name one thing that um, I think the one that I aspire to the most is, is the artist stance. Hmm. And that has been that it, it probably I envy that one the most I feel like I don't have that but I am so powerfully moved so often by both art and by humor people who can tackle this with some humor mm. um, I aspire to that too because uh, I mean it is serious and painfully so and yet that's not always the best way to engage folks and so so I, I, I'm looking forward to reading some of that poetry. I'm to see it soon. <laughs> Happy to share it, yeah. Um, so another way to kind of look at approach, uh, I thought of the word approach when I read um, something that you wrote in your chapter it was actually one of your, your final comments when you talk about um, the spiritual practices of white people. And you talked about, um, you mentioned this term, um, epistemic humility as a way to enter into the work. Um, and that's kind of how I understand approach. How do we enter into the work? So whether it's an approach or a posture, um, can you say a little bit more about that term? Um, I think, you know, with, with clergy folks, you know, that might be, we can understand what you're saying there. Um, but to the person in the pew, what do you mean by that? You actually give a lot of great examples of it in your chapter, but wanted to hear from you live a little bit about that phrase. Well, let me talk a little bit about where it came from. 15 or so years ago, I was at a spiritual retreat for white people. And we were, this group was beginning to craft a workshop that white people could be part of to do their work. And this was in the Mennonite context. And um, there was a time when we each had the opportunity to reflect on a question that was meaningful for us. And um, out of an activist and congregational context at that time, I, I was living with the question of, how is the work that I'm doing against racism, how is my anti-racist identity like my identity as a child of God? Yeah. And um, as I spoke with a conversation partner and prayed about it and thought about it, I realized three things. Uh, when I would listen to God, things would go better. And when I would wait on God, things would go better. And when I was trusting God, things definitely went better. And similarly, um, when I was working with people of color and I would listen to them and follow their lead, things would go better. And when I would wait for the people I wanted to follow to feel the time was right to express their leadership, when I would wait on them, things would go better. And when I trusted them, things would go better. Mm -hmm. And so listening and waiting and trusting uh, became key spiritual disciplines. And they're really foundational for this notion of epistemic humility, because what it's talking about is, you know, uh, epistemology is a $10 word for the study of knowing things. Like how do we know stuff? And women of color theologians have been super strong in, um, following the lead of Patricia Hill Collins, for instance, and understanding an, an African-American feminist, she wrote Black Feminist Thought, understanding this notion that every, every theology, every um, intellectual work that is worth its salt is underpinned by an epistemology or by a way of thinking about what it means to know something. And Patricia Hill Collins talked about how uh, knowing is purposeful. And if it's not, then I don't know if she used this phrase, but somebody did. It's like intellectual masturbation, you know, it's not fruitful. Yeah. And so, so what is the purpose of knowing, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, 
who do you regard as adequate knowers? Who are the who are the trusted knowers in your circles? And for white people, for many of us, the opportunity to listen to and follow the lead of a person of color is altogether too rare. In fact, we have to go looking for it. Mm. And so when I'm in a setting uh, where that's possible, I want to be quiet and listen and wait for a call on me to do something or think something. Uh, And I want to trust, even if it seems like, oh, I'm not sure about that, or that's scary, or or that's triggering my shame or my guilt. Still, I want to trust what I'm hearing and what I'm being called upon to do. And so that notion of epistemic humility is one where I am not assuming that I need to be in charge, that I know the answer, that I know best, that I should make the decisions about the budget, that people should be reporting to me that just because I've donated money to you, that, that therefore you're reporting to me, Mm. uh, you know, all kinds of things. So it really is a way of taking spiritual disciplines like fasting Mm. and applying them to being white, Uh, you know, fasting from speaking, fasting from being in charge, fasting from expectations, fasting Mm -hmm. from thinking that my cultural sensitivities need to be catered to it's there's a lot yeah it's very countercultural, um especially as a ministerial leader where you're looked to often to right. take the lead um so that does i can understand how that takes a lot of discipline and that certainly has been my experience of you tamri i mean even tonight um as one of the editors totally was ready to take the opportunity to let your light shine and right away you're like no it's not just about what I've written. Um, and so I want to just acknowledge that, that that has been my experience of you. Well, I wouldn't want to miss hearing a chance, having a chance to hear you talk about your chapter. That's, that would be missing too, too great an opportunity. Um, I had a question for you about, oh. I, I love the, both the approaches and the levels um, kind of thinking tools or structures that you have in your, in your piece. And I wonder if, um, if you might say a little bit about the levels and if you might say, what is your greatest challenge in engaging one of those levels or what is a growing edge for you with one of those levels? Yeah. Um, again, I, I really lean on the work of Bill Condraff, who, um, is, is a friend of the Alliance and, uh, author of, God's Tapestry, also a um, trainer with visions. Um, you know, I shared with my co-editors, I wanted to do sort of a synthesis chapter on, on different ways to get the work. And he presents that uh, we, that their oppression happens on four different levels. And so the work of justice needs to happen on all four levels. So that's uh, internally or yourself doing self work, interpersonally one uh, with another, uh, institutionally or organizationally, where you're trying to change as, uh, systems within a particular institution, and then cultural or societal, looking at the broader culture, um, and how oppression happens in both, and there are that transformation is needed on all all of those levels. Um, so I think the one that I'm living in mostly these days is the institutional or, or organizational level. Um, and that is particularly the church. Um, in my setting, it's uh, on a regional level or looking at it from a denominational perspective. Um, and the challenge is, is remembering that it's not just how we treat each other when we see each other or what we're thinking as we're engaging each other, but it's what are the practices that we do as an institution? What is the organizational norms and expectations that preference some people or some people groups over other people groups. And this is where tradition comes in so richly, particularly in the church setting. Um, And as you know, as a faith leader to challenge tradition, to challenge the way we've always done things, to challenge even um, what has become one and the same with polity um, uh, is is challenging and So it's really trying to identify and parse out and asking the question, yes, we've always done it that way, but why have we done it that way? Who determined that that was the way to do it? Um, 
what was the purpose of it? And is that still beating its purpose given our current constituency, our current needs? Um, so that's sort of the live question that I'm living every day. Um, and again, my, my growing edge and my challenge is what does that look like on a societal level? Because hand in hand with that is not just how does the church thrive for itself, but so that it can be present in the world. And so it's, it's not one or the other, it goes hand in hand. Um, and so that's sort of my growing edge, looking at it from a societal perspective. Yeah. Um, it can get hard to keep moving when you look at the societal level because it looks so monstrous and so huge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and when I think about the levels, it's, you know, uh, we can identify the four levels. We can identify the four approaches. Um, but really, life is messy, right? This work is messy, <laughs> as you know. Um, and so my question to you, as I read your chapter, you also frame it in a very um, organized way. You talk about the twin tasks for white people, and you talk about three broad strokes. The twin tasks being... Um, one, uh, to stop racist oppression of people of color, so racism. And secondly, to undo the false sense of superiority and advantages given to white people, so white supremacy. So those are the twin tasks that you name and the three broad strokes to help people think about their journey. Again, you name critical awareness, taking responsibility and working for transformation. So I think that was great ways to form it, but how have you experienced those twin tasks, those three broad strokes, the messiness of it? How have you experienced that in your journey? What are examples of aha moments or the dark nights of the soul um, or the really hard conversations? Um, and what advice might you have for others that are on this journey? Well, I wanna give credit where credit's due. Those three uh, broad strokes are the, the strokes of what a Salvadoran priest named Ignacio Ayacuria developed when he was working in El Salvador. And um, he's a hero to me for several reasons. One, because he was, uh, my understanding of his story is he was born in Spain and raised with a silver spoon in his mouth became a Jesuit and went to work with uh, the base communities in El Salvador and came to understand this model, came to develop this model as an epistemology underlying his own theological work. And it's so powerful. It feels so powerful to me. It has underpinned everything I have done since I learned it. And was um, those, those were the three main buckets of the work that uh, that became the book of constructing solidarity, you know, blowing out in detail what it means to engage each of those. And, and I'll just say coming to critical awareness is definitely the hardest of the three. Seems like it would be otherwise. Seems like, um, you know, maybe taking responsibility would be the hardest or working for transformation would be the hardest. Mm -mm. In fact, um, my experience of white people is that we want to jump right to the transformation piece, right? We want to have racial reconciliation day. <laughs> no, let's have racial reconciliation 400 years right um so and and so that piece of coming to critical awareness i think for white people is the hardest and the reason for that the, for the, the reasons for that are several but uh, i'll say that as i've come to understand how that begins is it begins with an experience of critical dissonance you look at the world and you say i i, I don't like this or this doesn't make sense or why is it like this? Or I don't want it to be like, this. and the direction that you go, if you're not putting your head in the sand is you start to pay attention and then you start to hurt mm -hmm. because the way things are right now, if you're paying attention, it hurts. And if it doesn't hurt, you're not paying attention. Okay. And what is our, what is our ability as white people to hold that pain and to let it motivate us to change? ourselves, our churches, our towns, our country, all those levels that you described are in play, but it all begins with an individual's ability to tolerate um, and mobilize from the feelings that you're having. And so, so that's where it begins is with paying attention and with an ability to feel your feelings and, and let them put you into motion. 
Um, and that, that never stops being a challenge as I move forward into the work. Uh, I, and I, and as I began to, to try to do work without fully understanding what I was doing, I would screw up. And so, so we, we developed some sayings to keep us moving, like feel the fear and do it anyway. Hmm. And um, there were times when I would experience someone, what we would say, calling me on my stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, stuff's not the word we use, but um, somebody letting me know that I had, I had a racist bonehead move. And so I would need to listen and try to learn from what had happened and commit to doing better. And I think that, that more and more it became clear that that was an important task for white people to do with each other and to do it with some grace because people of color have been uh, showing us so much grace for so long. Yeah. And it's really not your job. It's our job to help each other learn and to show each other um, a tough grace, a grace that says, you didn't know, but now you do. And so now you have responsibility to do it better. Um, and that's, again, you know, there's pain in that. And I don't know a lot of people who sign up for pain. <laughs> so um, recognizing that that is part of the journey, I think, is something that as white people, we need to to take on. That's part of what we accept when we get to the point of of accepting and then taking responsibility. But what I want to say is this, um, through those dark nights of the soul, and there were many of just feeling so much shame and guilt, the more I, the more I learned, the worse I felt so many times. Um, but then as the years went by and I learned more and I, and I began to grow into more authentic relationships and have more authentic community where I felt my worth grounded in my identity as a child of God and less in my white privilege and white enculturation, the way the relationships felt and that I was able to live in them shifted. And my life began to fill up with a joy mm. that I had really never experienced before. And I, a joy that I was freer to feel. And so sometimes when I first start walking, uh, working with a, a white person or a group of white people, and, and they're just, you know, in the swamps of despair, and guilt and shame, you know, I'll acknowledge that, yeah, those feelings are part of it, but I'll make them a promise that if they stick with it, joy will come. Mm -hmm. And it's a joy unlike anything we've ever known. And if there's anything that's a sign of the kingdom of God is that. So, you know, that's, that's a word that I, I try to share with people is that there is joy on the other side mm -hmm. of this journey. And, and, and I appreciate. I wanna, I'm sorry. Yep. I want to interject real yep. quick and just be, uh, to, uh, cognizant of our time um, and uh, just see if. And I know we do want to continue this conversation, but just to see if there are any attendees who have any mm -hmm. questions for our panelists um, who might even want to be, uh, you know, ask that question live. If you would like to do that, I can promote you um, to a panelist uh, briefly, and then you can ask your question live, and you can. Yeah engaging conversation. Is there anyone who, who is interested in that? Um, and you can think about it and we can keep talking. Um, but, and also remember to, uh, if you want to, you know, ask a question privately, there's also the chat feature and the Q and a, um, Kathy McGaugh, did ask, um, a question, I guess I shouldn't say who's asking, but there was a question about, um, the four, um, the, the model, uh, that I believe Marie, you were talking about, um, her question is, what was the fourth after organizationally? And cultural, I think cultural or societal. Okay. Got it. So personal, interpersonal, organizational or institutional and cultural or societal. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Do you have another question ready yet, Jason? I don't. Okay. Um, don't quite yet. Um, okay, I do want to encourage our but, um, participants to certainly ask questions. I was about to shift that way. Um, but as we wait yeah. for the next question, just to make a comment to Tamari, um, to say that mm -hmm. I appreciate your call to white people to do the work. Um, and as someone who, for myself, who's committed to be a bridge builder, and most of the time on my best days, don't mind, um, 
kind of doing some bridge building and translating and educating um, in my humanness, I get tired <laughs> yes. of, of being the one to explain uh, what went wrong in that, in that situation or what was off about that comment. Um, so I appreciate that call to others. Um, all right, friends, what questions do you have for, for Tamri or myself, or even just comments on how you've been engaging the book? Um, we want to hear from you, the readers, and, and what, what you're doing in your own communities about uh, racial justice. I can pose another question to Tamari if, uh, or uh, what are you feeling about um, promoting people that might wanna come to panelists so we can actually include them and their faces in the conversation? Yeah, we, I, that's a thing I could do as well. I could just promote everyone to panelists uh, if the panelists <laughs> are okay with that. And you, you can turn off your video and mute yourself if you would like, but I'll just, throw us all in there and uh, you do have to go down and, and stop your video and, 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 or start your video and unmute yourself. So uh, let's, let's try it. Yeah. If, if y'all are, are down, let me see if I can do this um, real quick. Yay. Hi everybody. There's some people. <laughs> Here we go. Wow, this is very powerful, this clicking button thing. Let's promote everybody. <laughs> well, there's Chris. Hey, Chris. There is a question from Christopher. Can I ask that aloud? And maybe Tamari might want to address that. So one question asked is, do we believe it is necessary to have a basic understanding of race and race theory? I've had a hard time even beginning conversations with a basic understanding. Yeah, one of the things that um, when I first began to um, participate with a group that was offering dismantling racism training, the power of it was a shared language and a shared analysis of what racism is and how it operates. And I think so many conversations founder for lack of that common understanding, things like what does it mean to be a racist? Um, I have I've just... I hate to say I've gotten comfortable with that term because it's not something any of us should ever be comfortable with, but I have gotten to the point of recognizing that um, it is an unfortunate reality because the, because our country is organized in a way that privileges white people and that disempowers people of color. That just is the reality. And so that kind of systemic racism is something that we all end up participating in, in different ways. And when you don't have an understanding of that kind of systemic effect, then it makes it really hard to grapple with reality as it is. And to have conversations, you're right, it's really tough. Thank you. I think that's one of the things that people tire of also is wanting to engage in conversations of race and then it's a different set of people all the time and you kind of feel like you're always down, starting on ground zero. Um, and so what are some tactics? I mean, one of the things is, is uh, communities committing to having that one-on-one -on -one conversation um, that, that I, you know, maybe even um, uh, there's uh, a leader, white, a white person that's committed to do the basic um, education Again, so to your point, Tamari, it's not always on the people of color to have to initiate that conversation. Um, but um, communities committing to have that one-on-one -on -one available to people so that they can enter in uh, wherever they are. Any, any other panelists have thoughts about that? How to get people on the same page so our conversations can be even more constructive than what they have been. I can say just confession uh, when you were talking with other people. So 
Uh, I was talking with someone today about, uh, I, I've signed up for a course. I hadn't told any of y'all I signed up for courses. Something that Mahan Siler suggested that I take is called Story Medicine. It's a woman in Asheville who teaches it. And, um, and the whole point of this course is to, is to work on my own racism. And, um, and I told someone I can't come to something because I'm going to this course. And she just looks at me and she says, well, Paula, you're not racist, are you? And so just the fact that I was telling her what I'm working on myself opened up an opportunity for her to acknowledge that she might have a few things of her own to work on. So I think just just being open and honest as much as we can and to tell people what we're engaged in doing is really important to, um, it, to invite others into that kind of engagement. And that's just a really simple thing to do. Thanks, Paula. Mm -hmm. It's good for us, I think, as white people to out ourselves as people who are concerned about racism and working against it in ourselves and, and in the settings around us. Um, it, it can create a lot of discomfort and even broken relationships that, that are not recoverable. And, you know, I think of that as entering in in a small way to the painful reality that people of color experience um, day in and day out. It's not the same, um, but it does begin to give us a sense of, of entering into that reality. Of course, we always have that choice of whether we say something or not. Um, but I think it is a choice that leads to, to greater freedom and that enables us to do the work with whoever is around us. And I think, I think for each of us too, we can always look and see what is the next step that we can take and what is the work that we can do in the relationships around us. You know, the, um, the useful language that Marie is bringing to us about levels and about different approaches. You know, in the teaching that I do, whether I'm teaching a class or a congregation or a group of students in the hospital, I always include a basic analysis of social location and power so the students understand and begin to work with that analysis from the very beginning. Um, and talking about power is what we're talking about. You know, I think that word doesn't get used nearly enough when we're talking about racism. Racism persists because it, benefits a group of people who derive power and access to benefits uh, because of it. That's why it continues. And so I think it's important for us to understand how, how that works and what the structures are that reinforce it and what the benefits are for white people accordingly. Mm -hmm. And to get comfortable talking about power is I think mandatory. Thanks. Thanks for um, bringing that up. One of the things that I have found in conversations is a, a sense of power, powerlessness, even among uh, white members in, in conversations around race. Um, and, and you talk about the sense of despair in your chapter, Tamari, on page 124. And I'll just read that paragraph, the second one from the top. When we begin to grasp the enormity of the task of personal, much less systemic change, we can be tempted to escape into cynicism or despair. This is where the discipline of hope comes in. People of color do not have the op option of despair. Neither do we. We can fast from despair in our words and in our thoughts. Despair is a poison, an illusion that Christ undid on the cross and in the resurrection. That resurrection power is available to us now to raise us from disbelief and disregard to radical and unending hope. Pray for it. Act as if you have it. Sing songs of resistance and find communities where others will believe and hope for you when you cannot. Uh, we've been uh, trying to have conversations here in Wisconsin about the power of the church and not the kind of power that comes with social location but the power that comes from the cross and from us being children of God and claiming that hope um, that we have. Um, can you say a little bit more about what, it, and it sounds like you're saying that it's gonna take this kind of power, this kind of resurrection power to, to turn things around. Um, what's the difference between this power and the power that's available through social location 
uh, through the systems that are currently operating in our society. I think the fear that people have is of loss, of loss of control, loss of access to resources, loss of power, and social power can be lost. It's, you know, it's difficult once it's entrenched, but it can happen. You can lose that power. Um, resurrection power cannot be lost. And I would say that the power that comes from a person who has lost their fear of loss is a person who is encouraged and emboldened and empowered to do things that uh, they would have thought impossible. And in fact, when you, when you come through this process of getting a critical awareness of reality as it is and understanding how it is, you get enraged and it, there's a great compulsion to make change and to be different and to grow into a different life. And that's, that's it, right? That's the power of God working in you from the inside out to transform you. It's not something that we can do of ourselves by ourselves. That's, I think the reason why I'm still a Christian is because there is this kind of powerful language and to me, a powerful reality of a force that can transform even me from the inside out. Um, there's no other explanation for what's happened in my life and in the life of so many other people. What you love changes, how you love changes. Um, what is important to you changes. And it's not by choice. It's by opening yourself to this power to transform you. And um, I mean, Annie Dillard talks about how, you know, we go to church and we sit there in these pews quietly, like, like it's a perfectly safe and boring place to be. And she says, we ought to put our seatbelts on. I mean, do we know <laughs> who we're dealing with here? Mm. And yeah, this is who we're dealing with here is someone who can um, carry us into a new reality and inspire us to help create it. It can happen. And that, that is something that uh, gives me tremendous energy to keep going even when especially when I fail I know that there's a power greater than me and greater than that's what than what is in the world at work in the world thank you any other participants want to speak to that what what is the what is the reclamation of power oh go ahead uh, Marie, we just had a question. Uh, Marie yeah. and Tamara from Toya, actually. Sure. Um, uh, I don't know if you can see it there. Uh, can you, you address hope in the context of anger that many African Americans feel about America's system of racism and depression? So, say the question again, if you don't mind, Jason. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, can you, you address in the context of anger that many African Americans feel about America's system of racism and oppression? Did you get that first part, Tamri? The can you address hope in the context? Yeah. Did you get that? Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah. I'm fighting with a, with a teenager who's watching Netflix. So we're kind of. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think anger and hope go together. I think that anger is deeply faithful response that says things are not as they should be. And I don't have a naive sense of hope. I know this struggle is going to outlast my life. It was happening before I was born. It'll still be happening after I die. And, and that makes me deeply sad. Um, but anger is energy for work and for movement. And um, my response to the anger of people of color is a reminder that more white people should be more angry. And and I mean, I think that's the most important thing I can say is that I'm not afraid of the anger of people of color. It's fully justified. It, I, in the face of it, I feel um, sadness, a sense that I haven't done enough, 
that I need to listen and wait and trust, but I also need to know when to speak and to move and to do. And um, I know in my relationships of accountability, there are times when people of color ask me or tell me, you know, Tamri, this needs to happen. And my answer is yes. And so I want my response to the anger of people of color, particularly African-Americans to be yes, but there's work for me to do. There's anger for me to feel. And I hope my hope looks like doing as a response to that. Active hope. I don't know, Toy, does that feel responsive to what you're asking? She may have stepped away. Oh, there she is. I think you're still muted, Toya. Oh, yeah, I'm not sure if you're hoping to respond. I, I think I might see your lips moving. I don't know if you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't see a microphone. Okay. Oh, she said thank you. Um, other questions? We, we were saying earlier, um, the facilitators that uh, we certainly don't have to stay the full 90 minutes if, um, you know, to drag out if there aren't other questions, but we also don't want to cut off anyone that may have a question to share verbally or to type. Yeah. Chris, you just, would you like me to read your question or would you like to, um, Christopher has a question. Looks like he just okay. stepped away recommendations on how to address gatekeepers, someone who's concerned with reconciliation seeming united. And when this gatekeeper is faced with a question of justice, he or she shuts it down. Um, uh, he, uh, Chris says, he, I had an incredible group of five pastors and the conversation was moving along and the gatekeeper went as far as to state that African-Americans are more uh, Obama caused more division, where should stand for the anthem, et cetera. Tamri, do you see the question? I don't know if I you don't. caught all that. If you open up your chat box, if it helps to read Chris's question, Christopher's chat question. Box, yeah. mm -hmm. Gatekeepers. Um, Yeah. Well, sadly, my sense of this is when when people have this kind of shut it down, it's because they're having a feeling that they can't tolerate. In addition to the fact that they don't have really an anti-racist analysis or a critical analysis or a critical awareness of reality as it is. So. Um, you know, when there's a group that has kind of moved along in its trajectory and has a shared understanding and is fully engaged with that, somebody who's back here in their journey is not going to be able to, to feel okay with that and will have that kind of reaction. Um, it's one thing for a person who doesn't have a lot of power in that situation to, um, you know, have distress in that moment. But when somebody who has power to shut it down, uh, feels that kind of fear and uncertainty, um, that's painful. And that's, I mean, I think there you need to look at just at a systemic level, how is this group constituted? Um, what is its goal? What are its deeper values? And what is going to be the cost of the group of backing up to the point where uh, the level of understanding of this person is, and then moving forward again, more slowly, 
in a way that brings them along. And I don't, I don't know, Chris, is the, gate, the gatekeeper is a white person, I'm guessing. So I want to say that that working with that person, you know, I would hope that would be the job of white people with a critical analysis. Um, that's that's going to tend to be my hope in those settings, because it ought not always be on the people of color to do that work. And it was such a hard situation. Are, are you able to hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. And it was such a hard situation because uh, the guy, he's um, he's a white guy. And the experience was 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 tragic because I usually use the language African American, European American, and Asian American, and so forth. Um, but um, as I began to speak, he looked at me and asked me, "Well, how would you like it if I called you the N word?" Uh, he was objecting to being called a Euro American, and he stated that he's been to thirty two different countries, he's been to every single continent, and he can he's um, uh, he's able to speak five different languages. Um, and the, the kicker was the conversations that I began, they caused people to feel uncomfortable, but you can kind of look at the effect of the people and you can tell that they were becoming, uh, they were really engaging in some self-reflection. And then he framed this whole notion as when you focus on a gospel, you just throw away all that other stuff and, and you just kind of learn to live together and, and to be okay. And the emotion in the room just completely changed. And it was so painful to me um, that, that I contacted Jason and I, I, I felt like a statement that my professor made to me almost 15 years ago. And he said, you're gonna find that there's gonna be a desire within you to be with people who think and behave like you, even if they're not the same color as you. Um, and I really felt that. And this is a Christian. We live in the same rural area uh, in northeastern Texas. But for the moment, I genuinely felt like he wasn't a Christian. I, I really felt that way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I had a hard time even wondering if I could identify him as a believer. And I know that's not my, my place, but it felt like such evil that I couldn't see any Christ in it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it. And I almost wondered, Am I doing a disservice by continuing not to converse because I want to continue to converse and try to dialogue because I really believe um, th that we should work toward a united body. Um, but, but I almost wonder, it, am I really doing my calls a good service by even identifying this person as my brother or sister? And, and it, I've been through a lot of different mm -hmm. things, but this one, for some reason, touched a nerve that nothing had ever touched. And, and so I was uh, it, it hurt quite a bit. Mm -hmm. One, one thing that comes to mind, Christopher, and then I have a question for Tamari on the same topic. Um, is there something in the system of this group or is this, uh, are the five of you or six of you in a particular organization, institution together, same church? Is there something in that cult, the organizational system that allows him to be a gatekeeper that, that offers him that power? There, there is not, um, other than his, uh, he's pretty much, he was the one who initiated the community pastors. Uh, we call ourselves the community pastors because our school district is called Community ISD, okay. uh, Independent School District. And so uh, he's, the, um, he's the one that organized us. Now, this conversation was initiated at my request um, because when we would get together monthly, we would eat and honestly, we didn't really talk about a lot. And, and I was kind of bothered because I didn't think it was the best use of our time. And so with this conversation, uh, a few of us were willing to engage in it. Uh, others were afraid, but he somewhat sees himself as the authority. But more than anything, I almost wonder if he felt threatened because there was a person that could speak about issues of justice that he could not. Um, because he's regularly stated, I once had a church, uh, he, um, that he once had a church that was 30% uh, white, 30% Latino, 30% black. I don't know if it's true or not. <laughs> I don't know if it's true or not. Um, but with the way he talked to me, I'm kind of wondering if that's the case, what's really going on. Um, but it's like, he really wanted to shut me down and discredit and discredit me. And there wasn't love there. I mean, there, there really and truly wasn't. And I've been in experiences to where I've been called some of everything. I've even had people attempt to physically assault me. Um, and, and I didn't feel as bad as I felt this one. 
this one really and truly felt like uh, a wolf in sheep's clothing mm-hmm. and it did something and I'm still not okay. <laughs> and I, yeah. cause I don't know how to respond and I don't know what to do um, because I felt like if his agenda is accomplished, which is definitely being accomplished now by, by many others, including him, um, then at the end of that will be continue dehumanizing and mistreatment and neglect and insensitivity toward people that the Jesus that I understand from scripture says we're supposed to resist and oppose. And so I'm, mm-hmm. I'm kind of stuck. I don't know what to do. Sure. So my question to you, Tamri, is, is the role of allyship and how do you begin to develop that if that's not already present? Um, how yeah, how can people of color begin to maybe recognize if, if people aren't stepping up on their own, if white allies are not stepping up on their own, um, what, what can be done to begin to develop that allyship network? Yeah, I'm not sure what the immediate response needs to be to the gatekeeper, Christopher, but my sense is that um, working with white people in your area who do have more of a grasp of reality might be a place to consider uh, trying to connect and to invite those friends to be in dialogue with this person um, so that it's not all on you or on this group. Um, I, the word ally is useful, but in this sense, also problematic. I just want to say that, that for me as a white person, I don't, I can be an ally to the work that a person of color is doing, but I'm not an ally in the work of dismantling racism. It's our work, white people's work, primary. Um, and we need to be taking initiative to address situations that are within our reach. Um, However, I do understand myself to be in accountability relationships with people of color such that they can say to me, Tamri, I need you to do this. And I and I understand myself called and sent to go do that thing. So, you know, I would love, Christopher, for you to have people in your life like that, that you can reach out to and say, you know, this is problematic. I suspect the person who's the gatekeeper would feel very threatened by being approached on this. I mean, he sounds like he feels very threatened. Um. And there is a lot of that sensation out there and it's only going to increase because um, these United States, they are a changing and uh, the United States is getting browner. Thanks be to God. So there's a lot of sensation of threat and that, that sensation has certainly been fomented by a lot of our politicians because a fearful populace is more easily mobilized. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm so sorry this has happened. Um, and, and in terms of your dialogue with him, getting below the, the issue as it currently is to what are the values underneath your positions, if you choose to be in conversation with him, maybe a way to go to say something like, you've really got some heat here. You know, I wonder if you would tell me what, what feels so important to you about this? What is happening for you as we have this conversation? And try to understand what the values are uh, and what the feelings are that are underneath what his experience is. Um, you know, I, I almost don't want to suggest that. Like, I don't want you to have to do this work. But it, if you so choose, that would be one approach would be to try to get at the values and, and the emotions underlying the experience that he's having. It's very helpful. I kind of have a question for Christopher. Are you the only African American in that group? I am. Yes. Okay. One of the things that I was thinking about, uh, and it kind of goes back to an earlier question, and uh, I believe it was how do we begin to, uh, I want to say how do we be, begin to dialogue, and it may be, uh, that may not be exactly the phraseology that was used, but one of the things that I believe is that um, this especially, well, specifically this current administration has uh, created an environment in which uh, we who are Christians uh, really have to uh, do what Jesus did and meet people where they are. Mm-hmm. And in meeting them where they, they are, it, I believe it's going to make us uh, extremely uncomfortable. 
uh, because I believe these are conversations and are the context of these conversations are such that we have not had to have in the recent past. And they are, uh, they are what I usually generalize, call uh, difficult conversations. Um, I, I, I would be curious to know if when you all established this group, if you agreed upon a specific focus, a specific uh, vision, mission for the group, or was it just a group that you that, that was gathered to try to address these 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 um, issues? And I ask because your your gatekeeper uh, per se, if he's the one who called this group together, and I'm assuming invited you to invited folk in to uh, participate, uh, what his underlying reason was for this. And if he is being combative and, and, and trying to shut, shut folks down, then uh, there is something much deeper at work in him mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that's, that's going on. For and sure. it might be just a, an, an instance where, you know, you get him outside of that group and speak one-on-one. -on -one. Because a lot of times, once we get outside of the group where we have, folks have a lot of power, uh, then that those defenses kind of come down. Uh, I experienced a lot of that when I was in seminary, uh, uh, being uh, African American and gay, and you know, people telling me I couldn't be in their pulpit and all this craziness, which you know, that's fine and dandy with me. Uh, I wasn't trying to be in their pulpit anyway. But uh, after class, we'd be in the parking lot, and those very same people would come and say, "So, well, what if this if this happens? Then what what is this about?" And can you tell me a little bit more about that? So sometimes I think the defenses that people raise in group settings, uh, they kind of diminish when you get them one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. because there's not that uh, fear of them losing face or whatever you know they want to call it uh, in front of a particular group. And I, I don't know the, the people you're talking about, but just as I was listening and thinking, those are kind of my thoughts. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's good, Lisa. It definitely is because, um, and and that that's something that as I prayed about it, I've really realized the need to to try to dialogue with him um, outside of the group, and it, it's a group that was originally originated by him for the purpose of fellowship. I requested for us to meet in addition to that to address specific issues, and I laid out. Um, let's look at the isms that we're struggling with and kind of. Think around them um, and move forward. And when I say he shut it down, he shut it down and basically returned it to fellowshipping only. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not quitting. Yeah, so that's good. Well, Thank you. and I think with fellowship, and that's part of truncating pieces of ourselves, right? What what does fellowship mean um, mm -hmm. in a real Christian sense? Are we able to bring our full selves and the concerns that we carry? that sometimes are tied to just things we care about, but sometimes are tied to our identity. Um, is, that, is that what we're talking about when we're talking about fellowship? So even um, a, a, if, it, if it needs to be a biblically-based conversation on what do we mean by fellowship. Um, and then the other piece with just group work and, and again, creating cultural um, organizational norms it may not be effective being doing this as a reaction to that conversation, but at some point, are there ground rules of engagement that this group can lay down? How, how, do, we, how do we do fellowship with respect for one another um, and having some kind of covenant of relationship that the group adhere, adheres to at every time they gather? Um, a couple other thoughts. Any other questions? Well, maybe as some, um, maybe to summarize um, or to have some closing thoughts um, as we begin to part. Um, one other thing that I wanted to highlight that I appreciated about uh, Tamari's approach in her chapter is highlighting um, the approach of spiritual practice. Um, and that's something that I resonate with. That's, that's an approach that um, I have understood my call that to understand who I am as a cultural being and how I engage with other people and what that means in my leadership role is very much tied to spiritual practice and understanding God's work, not only in my life, but in my context. 
Um, and so um, wanted to give Tamri an opportunity to maybe say something about this journey as spiritual practice, um, as maybe some parting thoughts that you might have. Yeah, I'm thinking about um, Maria Harris and her book, Fashion Me a People. She has this section where she talks about uh, like a covenant for a congregation to engage. And it goes something like, we as a congregation cannot live out our uh, lives as disciples of Jesus Christ while turning our back on and fill in the blank. And for me, as soon as I read those words, it was like, well, I can't live out my um, life as a disciple of Jesus Christ while turning my back on racism and how it warps white people and people of color. And so that is the primary commitment of, of my life of discipleship and many, many, many spiritual practices have grown out of that and have helped me with that. I've mentioned a few of them. Um, the listen, wait, trust practices, uh, speaking, acting, and doing when called upon, fasting from the usual things that white skin privilege hands to me, like the ability to speak in a space, to make decisions, to expect people to report, you know, what they're doing. Um, those, those kinds of things, the basic structures of Christianity, I think, are so helpful for us. You know, it, I think it's dangerous to to compare myself to the, the Christ of the Philippians hymn. So let's just pretend I'm not doing that. But that notion of, you know, Christ emptied himself and um, took on the form of one lesser than what he truly was. And why did he do that? For love. And I want there not to be anyone I cannot love. I don't want to be prevented from loving someone by the things that I've internalized from racism. And so I work to root those things out because I want to be free to love um, anyone I come across in all their particularity, you know, not because I'm colorblind. I want to see color. Mm -hmm. I want to see um, all the, the differences and the uniquenesses and the particularities of the people around me. And I want to love all of that. And I don't want anything to keep me from it. Yeah, oh, thank you. Uh, just a note on spiritual practice that I'm trying to develop in my own life and my own walk. Um, do a lot with if there is a, an instance that happens that turns me upside down and that um, gets me fired up, that hurts me. Taking some time away to prayerfully consider um, what are the values in me that were rubbed against? Um, and where, where did I feel energy? Where, where, where did I feel hurt? Um, come into grips with my own expectations of that situation. Um, and then um, particularly with the levels, thinking about what, what needs to happen next, whether it is it, work within myself, interpersonal, structural, or societal. Um, so that's something that I've been trying to develop in my own life. Um, another piece that I um, go back to often comes from Eric Law's work, and he calls it the gospel, the cycle of gospel living, and um, both the cross, the, the sacrifice, and then also the empty tomb or the resurrection, and that in a community of faith, there will be some people that are called to sacrifice, and other people that it's time for them to be able to experience victory and experience new life and resurrection. And that is a cycle. Um, and so as a person of color, one of the most eye-opening things that happened to me is I did one of those exercises of power shuffles where you, know, you ask a question and if that applies to you, you take one step forward or one step back. And I was in a setting of mostly clergy and um, very mixed culturally. Um, and oftentimes I can get stuck in, I'm one of the younger ones, I'm a female, I'm a person of color. And so I'm at the bottom of the power totem pole. Um, but after this exercise, I was up front with one of my white sister's colleagues. And it was an eye opening for me because there are other things that affect our own sense of agency more beyond the, again, the typical categories of identity. And that reminded me that even me too, 
to see how the cycle of gospel living lives out in my life, that I'm not always being the one that's calling out um, injustice, but I am recognizing my own sense of power and agency and fighting for other people. Um, and so that's sort of this cyclical, cyclical spiritual practice I try to incorporate in my life as well. Um, thanks, Tamari, for your dialogue tonight. Thank you all. Uh, Jason, I'll turn it over to you if you have some other closing thoughts and promotion of our webinar in November. Definitely. Um, yeah, I would like to remind everyone that in uh, two weeks, I believe, uh, November 7th, two or three weeks, we're having our second um, or our third uh, in this series of Trouble the Water. We're going to be having uh, Cody Sanders, who's on the on the call with us uh, today, um, one of the editors um, Deborah DeMars Conrad and uh, Judge Wendell Griffin will be joining us. So that will, I'm, I'm looking forward to that as the closing in our three um, uh, discussions. And as we close this evening, I actually, we're doing this backwards, but I'm actually curious as to who's on the call and where we're located. And so I was wondering if we could go around the room and uh, introduce ourselves and just say where we're from and uh, just kind of have an idea of where we are geographically. And who we are. Okay. All right, I'm Christopher Jones. I'm in the northeastern corner of the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex, a little place called Levon, Texas. Great. Great. I'm Paula Dempsey. I live in western North Carolina and I've had the privilege of being connected with the Alliance for some time <laughs> and I work with the Alliance now. It's great to see all of you here. I'm Cody Sanders. I'm uh, one of the co-editors of the book and I'm in um, Boston, Massachusetts. I'm Kathy and you can't see me, <laughs> but I'm here and um, I'm on the staff of the Alliance as well. And I live in Western North Carolina also. Happy to be here. I am Lisa Dunson. I'm in Washington, D.C. Um, Cody, Pastor Dennis told me to tell you hello. <laughs> I told him I'd be on the, on the webinar tonight, um, but he made, told me to make sure I sent you a hello. Well, I'm, uh, I'm Carolyn Dugan, and I'm the CD, and then Kim is sitting over there listening. Um, <laughs> and we are in Wisconsin. We're part of American Baptist Churches of Wisconsin, and we're at the Camp Tamarack right now. <laughs> <laughs> And Toya. Oh yeah, I think Toya's audio is out. Toya is also. <laughs> and we've had some cats <laughs> attending tonight too. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All creatures of our God and King. So. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I would like to this on November seventh. Uh, we will uh, reconvene and we'll do it at the same time. Um, different, um, different uh, link. So just uh, attention to our Facebook link. But um, as we end most of our Alliance calls, I just want to uh, extend the peace of Christ with all of you uh, here tonight. And thank you so much uh, for being with us. So peace be with you. Peace be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.